Hi, this is Fish and welcome to Fish Picks. Today we'll be picking up where we left off last time with the second of our three-part series on hard key impressioning. So let's get into it. In last week's episode, we defined what we meant by impressioning, and I took you through all of the tools that I use for this process, and then we rounded things off with some tips on how to prepare your key blank to receive nice clear marks. Today, we're going to be getting really granular about how to work the blank in the core of the lock, how to read the impressions generated, and the filing techniques that I'd recommend to get accurate and reliable results. And we'll begin then by looking at the manipulation of the key blank in the core in order to transfer the key pin information to the surface of the blank. It's important that we're disciplined about this process. Random jiggling of the blank will result in unclear marks, which is obviously problematic. Instead, therefore, I'd recommend the following operation each time the key is placed in the lock. First, ensure that the blank is inserted all the way into the lock and is held in a neutral position. Then lift the impressioning handle up, apply torque whilst maintaining upward tension, perform three firm up and down movements, and then return to neutral. And we're going to repeat this sequence, but this time with downward force applied. Push the handle down, apply torque whilst maintaining downward tension, perform three up and down movements, and then return to neutral again. You'll notice that there's quite a lot of movement in the vice in this footage, but this is simply because the table where I'm filming is a little too lightweight, and so I'm actually lifting it up and down. In reality, I use a much heavier duty table when I'm impressioning, so this isn't normally an issue. You should also try and ensure that your vice has little to no vertical movement, so that all of the force is transferred to your blank instead. This sequence ensures that we'll receive good pin transfer marks at the front and the back of the blank. It's hard, of course, to identify how much force you should be applying. Too little and we'll get faint or no marks. Too much and we're in danger of snapping the blank. So this is a case of experimenting and getting a feel for the sweet spot. Having performed this set of movements, we can then remove the key from the core and inspect the blade. As mentioned in part one of this series, good lighting and optics are critical here. Remember that a number of factors will determine the quality of the markings, including the shape of the key pins, the material they and the blank are made from, the neutrality of the blade surface, and the efficiency with which we apply force to the meeting point between the blade and the key pins. One technique which will definitely help to identify and read the markings is to get used to rolling the key so that different parts of the blade catch the light. Depending on which stage of the impressioning process you've reached, the marks might be small indentations against an otherwise smooth surface of the blade, or they could be horizontal scratches. They might appear in the centre of the blade or off to one side, and they can move forward or backward from the centre point of the initial notch. The marks created when you first work the blank in the core should reveal all of the key pins at play, but after that it might well be that only one or two of the pins will leave a mark as the binding order of the stacks starts to affect things. Once you've inspected and identified these initial markings, it's important that this information is preserved because these will dictate all of the filing work to follow. So with this in mind, I'd suggest you take a fine tip marker and not only indicate the mark on the flat of the blade, but also down the side of the blank. And then you can use these vertical guides to maintain accurate file placement for the rest of the impressioning process. Now, if you happen to know the pin spacing for the model of lock you're working with, you can always check your marks against this data or mark the sides of the blank ahead of time, which can help you zero in on where to look for the impressions. I know that Schlage has a spacing between pin stacks of 3.96 millimetres. So if, for whatever reason, I don't get clear markings for all five of my pins, I could use this information to extrapolate the place where the mark should appear. 
In fact, some impressionists not only mark up their key, but they file shallow starter grooves in the blank, which can be a wise strategy, for example, in a competitive environment or where the operation is time sensitive. When learning to impression, I think it's useful to separate out the skill of mark making and interpretation from filing technique, which is what we're going to take a look at now. We've already looked at the kinds of files used in part one of the series, but now we're going to consider how we use them. First, we'll address the direction and angle of stroke. We're looking to create a flat and even groove across the width of the key blade, and so it's important that we hold the blank steady and upright and direct the file perpendicular to this angle. The file should then be pushed away from the body only, along two thirds of its length, and then should be smoothly lifted at the end of the stroke. We also want to ensure that we're precise in the placement of the file tip so that it rests on the initial mark or at the centre point of the notch if the impressioning process is already underway. You can stabilise the tip placement using the nail of your thumb or finger, but be advised that you will tend to file away part of the nail as you can see here. Whether this is just an occupational hazard or indicative that I need more practice, I'm not sure. You can apply finger tape to protect the nail, or you could grind away a small section along the length of the file, which you can then use as a contact point for the thumb or finger. Of course, once the notches have been established, the file will ride within these channels and there'll be no longer any need for the thumb or the finger guide. The real trick to good filing technique is evenness and consistency of pressure applied. We need to remember that we're looking to remove very precise amounts of material. In most cases, the differences between cuts is just fractions of a millimeter. So we can't afford to be heavy handed, but equally we want to become as proficient as possible. To this end, I'd encourage you to try the following couple of exercises. First, Find out the cut depths for the model of the key you're working with. In my case, I know that the cut depth for Schlage is 0.38 millimetres. Now, take a key blank and mark up positions along the length of the blade. And at the first position, perform just two strokes with your file. Then perform four strokes at the second point. Go on to perform six strokes at the third. And you guessed it eight strokes at the fourth. And then you can take a pair of calipers and measure the depth of each groove that you've created. If you were consistent in your stroke and the pressure applied, then that should be reflected in the relationship between the cuts. But what I found is that my initial couple of strokes at each point always removes significantly less material because I'm focusing more on the accuracy of the file placement and the tip of the file doesn't have a groove yet to sit within and gain purchase. This exercise can also help you to determine the number of file strokes that you'll typically need to create the equivalent of one depth cut. So in my case, the results were as follows. Two strokes saw me remove just 0.06 millimeters of material. Four strokes then took away 0.28 millimetres, six strokes removed 0.33 millimetres, and after eight strokes I'd removed 0.38 millimetres, which is the equivalent of a Schlage single cut. So it stands to reason that eight strokes of my file should consistently produce that outcome, but we can never add material back onto the overfiled blank. So I'm going to perform six or perhaps seven more conservative file strokes in response to each mark when it comes to impressioning my target lock. The second filing exercise is then to take a key for which you already know the bitting and attempt to produce a series of grooves until you meet the bitting for those particular pin stacks. So I'm using a Schlage key with the bitting code 86158. So first what I'm going to do is file away all five cuts to a one depth, aiming to take away 0.38 millimetres of material, reducing the blank, which is typically 8.5 millimetres, down to 8.12. 
I'm then going to check for consistency for each of those notches using a pair of calipers before I move on to phase two. So cut three is now at the correct depth and I'm looking to now remove the other four notches down to a five cut, removing the equivalent of four more cut depths from positions one, two, four and five. So the target this time is to produce a reading of 6.60 millimetres. By working at positions one, two and five first, I can get as close to the target depth as possible. And if I take away a little too much, it doesn't really matter. I haven't ruined the work I've already carried out because it will only be when I tackle position number four, which actually is a five cut, that it really matters to be precise. Again, I'll use calipers to check my accuracy and then I'll move on to phase three, where I'll look to take notches one, five and then two down by one more depth to a six cut. And then finally, I'll file away positions one and five to the eight cuts. So this process gives me plenty of filing practice, allows me to dial in the consistency of the material I remove and should help me build some confidence because I'll be working towards a key that does open the lock. And if I can't, I can match it against my master key to see where I've gone wrong. This might seem unnecessarily pedantic, but I think it's worth worrying over the details from the offset because impressioning really is about precision and concision in order to yield a working key with as few strokes as possible. And if I can't generate a key from a known template, it'll be all the harder to do it from impression marks alone. Depending on the bitting of your target key, you may find that as you draw close to the correct cuts, you'll generate some really steep peaks and valleys, and these can cause your key to become stuck in the lock body. This is called canyoning. It's not really an issue with machine cut keys because the peaks between pin placements are automatically trimmed away. So it's a good idea to just take away those sharp tips with a flat file, being careful to preserve the depth changes between adjacent cuts. So the max or maximum adjacent cut specification for Schlage is a generous seven, but some lock types are less tolerant of these sharp changes. So let's bring it all together again now. Every time a series of marks are achieved and we then file away material accordingly, we'll be taking a step closer to producing a working key. Consequently, the numbers of pins which are preventing the core from turning will reduce and you'll start to notice more movement when you apply torque. Eventually, you'll have just one or two notches which are fractions of a millimetre too shallow. And when you attempt to apply turning force, the key will rotate, albeit stiffly in the first instance, to secure an open. To complete the impressioning process, it's just a case of performing the mark making operation one more time, identifying the marks and applying just one or two file strokes to those positions on the key and you should achieve a smooth movement. Ideally, you should be able to effect an open with just a thumb and finger grip. So you now have all the information you need to start impressioning your first locks. And this also brings us to the end of part two of this series. In next week's episode, which will be the last in this series, I'll be bringing all of what we've learned together and we'll be trying to produce a working key for a real world cylinder recording the marks and the filing process at each step along the way. But for now, thanks for watching and until next time, take good care.